Hello. Hello. Um, we're having uh, the privilege of interviewing two very important dignitaries um, from the Irish National Caucus based in Washington, a human rights group, which deals uh, acutely with the issue of both Ireland and also human rights abroad. They are Father Sean McManus, the president, uh, who's also a World Chief Judge, uh, Prize, uh, World uh, Peace Prize Judge, and Barbara Flaherty, the vice president of the INC. Over the decades, including from before I was born, Father Sean has been at the forefront, uh, as is Barbara, in promoting the McBride principles of fair employment. Um, it's fair to say, and even documents released by the British government credit them um, as having been the primary drivers in the fair employment legislation that was introduced in the north of Ireland to outlaw discriminatory practices on the basis of religion and various different protected characteristics. At present um, and historically, they have taken on the cases of a number of victims and survivors, uh, particularly that of the Protestant Unionist uh, Raymond McCord and also another Prot Belfast Protestant, Richard Kerr, who was a victim of the Concora Boys Home, who now lives in the US. Um, We've asked them to uh, engage in an interview with us um, to gauge their responses to a number of seminal issues which we feel are of pertinent importance to generations young and old. And so without any further ado, I'm going to start um, asking them and see what they have to say. Now, the first question is Barbara and Father Sean. It's an honour to have you both with us. Having read your book and knowing the work you both do on, uh, for the issues of Ireland and human rights, can you tell us what were the primary formative experiences you both have been through regarding the Irish issue? I mean, what I'm asking is what made the biggest impact on you both at any point to do what you now do with the Irish National Caucus? Well, if I can begin, I would begin to answer that by paraphrasing the old Fenian O'Donovan Rasa. I was born an Irishman. I was baptized a Catholic in a racist, meaning anti-Irish, and sectarian, meaning anti-Catholic state, the state of Northern Ireland. And I was raised in a deeply patriotic family in a historic parish of Kinoli in County Fermanagh, which is divided by the border. It is. That's how I became involved. And now over to Miss Barbara. Okay. Well, my husband, Martin, who is from Galway, he was always concerned about the Irish issue and he brought me in on it even before we were married. We would be picketing BOAC, British Overseas Airlines offices and uh, the British Embassy. And this was before Father Sean came to America. However, it was only when Father Sean came to Baltimore that things really started to roll on the Irish issue. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when Congress was involved. And as the uh, Sunday World recently said, Father McManus actually put Northern Ireland on the map. And that's where we begin. And that's what stimulated interest in this area for the Irish National Caucus, seeing his proactive stance and his dedication to a united free Ireland. And if you're asking about what incidents I found truly reprehensible, well, internment in 1971, because that is so against American values that any American hearing about it had to be upset about it. And then in 1972, Bloody Sunday. And then you can move forward from that to the hunger strikers when they were treated horribly by Margaret Thatcher. There are so many things that stimulate a continuance with the caucus and the good work the caucus is doing for justice and peace. And Father Sean is spearheading all of this. And there have been so many people who try to put him off his path in one method or another, but they never succeeded because he kept his eye on the prize. Now back to you, Father Sean. Well, go ahead. Do you have anything to add? No, well, that, that's the beginning. We can talk about the other details as, you, as we progress here. Okay. 
Um, so can you both tell people watching about what the McBride principles actually are and how they arose? Now, I know about them, but what factors necessitated them, given that the Thatcher govern government more or less bitterly credit you as being the driving force behind the fair employment laws and also more or less the Equality Commission in the North um, in the North of Ireland and do you feel they can be strengthened in the present day for the current generations particularly given the rise of things like Islamophobia and so forth? Well the Irish National Caucus launched the McBride Principles on November 5th uh, 1984 um, to be a code of conduct for the American companies doing business in Northern Ireland. Now, when you begin to address foreign policy in America, you have to find the foreign policy nexus. So there were no big oil fields in County Fermanagh or Belfast or anywhere in Ireland. So what would concretely, financially link America and Northern Ireland, apart from moral concern about terrible injustice and oppression. Well, we had the major American companies doing business in Northern Ireland, which provided us with the perfect link the perfect foreign policy nexus. And you'll notice this. Before McBride was officially launched, Maggie Thatcher's favorite response to anything in America, as it was Conor Cruz O'Brien and some other members of the Dublin government at that time, please mind your own business. Hmm. Well, there is nothing more the business of America than American dollars, American investment. And Maggie stopped using that phrase. So for the first time, and this is literally true, back in, I think it was, um, Yes, it was July 1981, right in the middle of the hunger strike, of course. We had a meeting with, with a large number of members of Congress to brief them on this specific thing, the record of American companies doing business in Northern Ireland. It had never been raised in the entire history of the US Congress. Nobody from Ireland had raised it. None of the political parties, North and South, needless to say, ever raised that issue. And it went to the heart of our point, which was whatever your view about Northern Ireland and American foreign policy, there's all sorts of views. One thing is certain. One thing we must all agree on. No American dollars should subsidize anti-Catholic discrimination in Northern Ireland or discrimination anywhere in any part of the world. Yeah. Now, we had that meeting with the Ad Hoc Congressional Committee for Irish Affairs, which we also formed in 1979. And despite huge attempts to cripple it. In a very short time, we had over 130 members of Congress serving on that committee, which was chaired by Congressman Biagi, God rest him, of New York, a Democrat um, and a marvelous man. And the Irish government, sad to say, but predictably, joined the British government and the two embassies, the Irish embassy and the British embassy, spent enormous time trying to get people to leave the committee. I think they got one guy uh, to do it. 
uh, uh, Congressman Doherty, who launched uh, a campaign of actually attacking the caucus in Pennsylvania. And you know what? The next time he ran for election, we had a large part in beating him. And, I, and he has acknowledged that and he's complained about that. Uh, however, the significance of all of that is, I think, important. You see, I went around the United States talking to people and, and speaking to people. And I would point out to them very often when you have meetings, you could have those meetings if you were still home in Kerry or Fermanagh or Cork or anywhere. What's the point in telling the British government what to do if you do not tell your own elected officials on a national and even local level? Uh, don't tell the British government that they're discriminating because they know that. Everybody knew that. Yes. What have you told your local councilman or woman? What have you told your congressman or woman? What have you said, for example, in Boston that has millions of dollars invested, millions of dollars invested in American companies? Don't just lecture the British government, take your case to City Hall. And that, I think, was the unique impact of our approach. See, see on that, one of the things I would ask you to elaborate on, and you did it before splendidly in a video, was that just mention a bit about, um, I remember you saying about how at first it wasn't the Irish Catholic diaspora that were helping you. It was actually people from various different backgrounds. Um, Absolutely. And, and a bit about of that? course, that follows exactly on my point that no Irish political party, no Irish government, no Irish embassy, needless to say the British embassy, never raised this issue in Congress because this is not just um, refusing to let go. I, I think one has to, to treat history respectfully. And we have to say, and it's no surprise to anyone in Northern Ireland, uh, really, we have to say in the early days, up until Albert Reynolds came along with the Good yeah. Friday Agreement, God rest him, God rest Indeed. him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> up until that time, the policy of the Irish Embassy was never to raise the issue in Congress, ever. Ever, ever, ever. Now, they might have said, well, they do, they do it diplomatically, etc. But uh, I mean, that's not surprising because does anyone seriously think that the policy of Jack Lynch and Desi O'Malley and Conor O'Brien and Garrett Fitzgerald, that their policy was will exercise as much pressure on every level, political, economic, PR, even military, on the British government to end their oppression against Catholics in Northern Ireland. Can anyone seriously believe that? No, no. It never happened. And yet now some of those people are posturing as if they got in the United States Congress involved in standing up and criticizing the British. It's a terrible falsehood. It's an yes. absolute whopper of a lie. It they were never happened. It, it never happened. Now, we must, the audience must understand that the policy of the two governments, and I'm emphasizing that's because that's how the American government reacted. That's how members of Congress re reacted, by doing nothing, because the Dublin government didn't ask them to take any direct action. And when Teddy uh, Kennedy, God rest him, in the early days, advocated British withdrawal, affairs British withdrawal, 
Jack Lynch went on international TV and said, Teddy doesn't know what he's talking about. He is going to promote a civil war. He's going to promote violence. He's going to do this, that, and the other. And Teddy Kennedy was totally ambushed because he was put in a position by the British embassy and the Irish embassy, which was simply this, criticize the British government and you will be seen to be advocating IRA physical force, IRA violence, and how can a Kennedy of all people advocate violence? And Teddy Kennedy privately has admitted to many people, it was an impossible situation. He was blocked, put in a box, and he said to himself, Here's an exact quote, report it directly to me. He said, if I had done for Israel what I've done for Ireland, I would have been lauded and praised to the heights by the Israeli government. I tried to criticize the British government. I could take their criticism, but you know who did me in? The Dublin government. Uh-huh. Now, that shouldn't really surprise people who are well informed on, on this issue. So when we came to Washington, we opened the national office on human rights uh, day, December 10th, 1978. The first time the Irish ever had an office on Capitol Hill. Now, what does that tell you? The largest group in America, practically, 30 million or whatever, very well positioned, popular, anti-Catholic discrimination had virtually disappeared, they had come to power. But when I came first to Baltimore, I would run over to Washington as often as I could to speak to members of Congress. I ran into every conceivable lobby group working for their homeland, except one, except one. And I was astonished and and shocked. I couldn't believe it. And here's the problem. This is the way I analyzed it. Historically, The leaders in Ireland followed the, I think, the very short-sighted policy. We have to control Irish Americans. They're only as good or as bad as we say. That was the policy from the very beginning. It, it, It was the policy of Parnell, it was policy of Redmond, it was the policy of the De Valera Irish Republican Brotherhood, all of them, all of them control Americans. In a way, I can understand that. But, you know, the job of Irish Americans primarily is not to relate to a particular group in Ireland. I used to tell us, I referred to earlier on, I used to tell Irish Americans, look, if you want to have that conversation about beating up the Brits, go to Belfast, go to Kerry, go to County Fermanagh, have it there. Really, our focus in America should be, how can we exert American pressure to force the British to modify their thinking and to stop their cruel and unjust behavior, because that's the only thing we can really do. Now, of course, there are all those groups in this country, and I'm I'm not making any judgment on this at all, but there there was the historic tradition of people supporting the IRA. And some would say, look, the only thing that matters is getting the guns over to the IRA. That was a strong tradition, of course. And, and, it cannot be denied. However, when you think that England, 
was the largest, one of the largest suppliers of all types of military hardware in the world, second or third after America and other countries. They, they could deal with any amount of guns and they use that as a very convenient foil. And they made that the issue. And here's the thing. The first statement in 80, 83, or um, I, I'm not sure of the exact date at the moment. I should, it's burned in my memory, but I've forgotten right now. The first statement by the newly formed Friends of Ireland, led by Tip O'Neill and Teddy Kennedy and Senator Moynihan. Uh, their entire statement, check it out. There is not one word about British violence. Mm. The whole way they presented it was the problem in Northern Ireland are Irish Americans who are shipping guns to the IRA. That was it. That was it. Look, looking at the symptom without the actual cause as such. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it was, it was appalling lack right. of leadership and, and an outstanding, devastating example of collusion yes. with the British government and in effect with British violence. Um, now, that committee, when it was finally formed, our committee, the ad hoc committee, was formed, as I mentioned, in 1979. I think, I, I think the other one came in in the early 80s. Uh, but the point was very simple. And the spokesman for Speaker O'Neill explained it exactly. He said, the Friends of Ireland were formed so that Northern Ireland would not become an irritant between the British and the American government. Tip O'Neill said it very simply. He said, in six weeks, the Bayaji Committee and the Irish National Caucus will be out of business. That was the simple origins of the Friends of Ireland. Now, God bless. In 1995, Jimmy Walsh, who's no longer a member of Congress, but still yes. with thank God, a great Republican. Yes. He then was the chairman of the Friends of Ireland. And in one of our meetings, the first meeting to celebrate the fact that Congressman Gilman, our great friend, God rest him, Jewish American. We had a meeting in a the Foreign Affairs Committee, huge room, and a few hundred people to celebrate him becoming chairman of the committee. And Ben was very active in our ad hoc committee with Congressman Biagi. And uh, Congressman, oh my goodness, my great friend, now I've forgotten his name, Hamilton Fish. That, that's Hamilton it, yeah. Fish whose grandfather locked up the Fenians for crossing the river to invade Canada, for God's sake. A wonderful man, Episcopalian. The yeah. Adjew was Catholic, of course, but not Ecumenical. Irish. Hamilton Fish uh, was quintessential Episcopalian. Uh, some of the key people, the key people who helped us most were non-Irish and non-Catholic. Now, the said, um, the, the said man, Congressman, um, God, I've forgotten his name. No. The, uh, um, Jimmy, uh, uh, imagine he, he'd be shocked that I'd forgotten his name. I just mentioned his name a moment ago. Uh, he was the chairman of the Friends of Ireland. Oh, uh, Jim Walsh, was it? Yes, yeah. Jimmy Walsh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jimmy Walsh came into that hearing, or it wasn't a hearing, celebration, and essentially ended the split between the ad hoc committee and the Friends of Ireland. Uh, formally, even though in an informal setting, he said, I've come here to show solidarity. We are now one group united in standing up for justice and peace in Ireland. So 
since that time, thank God, um, thank God, uh, there I see really no distinction between the two groups. They've melded in effect. And now the Friends of Ireland, headed by Richie Neal, is doing tremendously important work. Uh, and he would now be seen as the primary lead in all of these issues. And I'm very glad, I'm very glad he's there. One of the points I, I want to put you, oh, sorry, Barbara, yes. Yeah, I want to mention uh, the great Congressman Ben Gilman from the Republican Party in New York. He became um, the chairman of the House International Relations Committee and he held the McBride hearing. But this is what he said about Father Sean. No one has done more than Father McManus to keep the US Congress on track regarding justice in Ireland. And uh, Ben Gimlin was a great friend to the Irish National Caucus, God rest his soul. And for anybody who wants to know details about the McBride principles and everything that Father Sean has been saying, they should buy his book. It's a primary source. Excellent. Uh, the third edition, 2019, and chapters 15 and 16 deal with the genesis, the campaign for the McBride principles and the anti-McBride uh, campaign. So much in that book that you're not going to find anywhere else. It is the best of all the um, books he has put out so Hold far. Hold it up, Barbara. Yeah. Is it? I, I don't know. This is gonna one, of, one of the points um, that I wanted to actually mention just on based on what both of you have said is that the ultimate confirmation of what both of you have mentioned is that before she died, Margaret Thatcher stated to a number of her advisors that she deeply regretted signing the Anglo-Irish Agreement, but it was the pressure from the Irish Americans in, in the US, which forced the representatives in Congress and also in the executive branch to pressure her into doing it. And even though, I mean, she deplored it, she didn't want anything to do with it, she thought the North was a security problem, but she did say that essentially the pressure from the, the ground up, from the likes of Father Sean and yourselves, um, it created a groundswell of support for the central issue of Ireland to the point whereby she was being so bombarded on this issue that she felt that she looked at the, the proposals of the New Ireland Forum and essentially what she was doing was she was taking the most moderate one and trying to dilute it a bit and you know that kind of became the Anglo-Irish yeah. agreement but yeah. but she did say that the, she Deeply, although she deeply regretted it, she said it would never have happened without the Americans. And that is why it's absolutely important to keep the US on board and especially Irish America and also the other groups that Father Sean mentioned who have been pivotal in terms of the struggle for justice in the North. So, and I mean, I, 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 sorry, sorry, Donald, go ahead. No, 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 no go ahead. I, I would go add, ahead. I would add to this uh, because yeah. this, this is the way things work in America. The first engagement we had, and one of the few times in like a hundred years that an American president really got involved with um, the Irish issue was Jimmy Carter, who's thank God still with us. And he, six days before he was elected, he met with us in Pittsburgh and he made the astonishing statement that America ought to be working for the reunification of Ireland. Now, instead of welcoming that, the awful man, Gareth Fitzgerald, as Foreign Secretary, contacted Carter's people demanding proof that Carter was not supporting violence. That's the way the game was played. And Carter said, of course, I'll send that, but I'm not sending it out before the election. Now, the Carter meeting was totally arranged by just a few of us, all Irish Americans. And here is significantly, because of the momentum of McBride all across the country, this is an important historical fact. Some people will want to play it down, of course, but that's okay, I'm used to that. The important fact here is that 
It was the McBride momentum all across the country that convinced Bill Clinton that he ought to meet with a group of us in New York at the famous meeting where he pledged, among other things, that he would support the McBride principles. Now, here's the big difference. And I remember turning around to Conor O'Cleary of the Irish Times saying to him, the all important thing now is that Albert Reynolds does to Bill Clinton what Garrett Fitzgerald did to Carter, rebuff him yes. and tell him he's doing harm, that he's going to cause violence. And thank God, thank God, uh, Albert Reynolds totally welcomed Bill Clinton's involvement. If he had rejected him, backed up by the British government, there would not have been any Clinton initiative. Now, Indeed. nobody arranged that meeting apart from Irish Americans. The yes. Dublin government didn't arrange it. They were alarmed by it, in fact. The yes. British government obviously didn't arrange it. No political person in Ireland, north or south, from whatever tradition, was involved in delivering Clinton to that meeting. That is significant. And, you know, we emphasize that because at the end of the day, there's always has to be, I, I see it as a sort of a healthy ten, uh, uh, tension between the people in Ireland and between Irish Americans, because they're over there and we are over here. And it is Irish Americans who should be setting out to change American foreign policy not a foreign government. And you see, that's what the Dublin government never really understood. That is why they were always opposed, every one of them, to the McBride principles. Every political party, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, Labour, even Sinn Féin at the beginning, even the Irish Republican movement dismissed McBride like being construction, uh, Reagan's construction engagement with South even, Africa. Even, even, even though, uh, even hmm? though just, to, just to make a point, even though Sean McBride himself was an IRA man, a cabinet oh. minister, a barrister. Uh, yes. And then, of the course, internet. when the Republican movement saw uh, that we were driving the British government crazy with the McBride principles, they changed and started to support the principles. But everyone, John Hume of beloved memory, every political leader is on record of absolutely with vehemently and with animosity opposing the McBride principles. Why was that? Why didn't any of those leaders ever come and testify before Congress? <laughs> None of them did. None of them did. And I would add here, you know, from, and this is an appalling, again, strictly from an American point of view. We had our first congressional hearing since 1920. In 1973. And I brought my brother Frank, who was an MP of Man in South Tyrone, to testify. And the other man was Rory O'Brady, the president of Sinn Féin. And Tip O'Neill threw a reception for them that evening. Now, after that happened, of course, we knew there would be strong reaction. And the Irish government and Gareth Fitzgerald in print and in his memoirs claims proudly proudly claims this, that he convinced the Speaker of the House to ban all congressional hearings on Northern Ireland. And he did it. He did it backed up by every political party in Southern Ireland and by John Hume and the SDLP 
in Northern Ireland. That cannot be disputed. Yes. And for like what, 74 to 1995, almost 20 years, there was a ban on congressional hearings on Northern Ireland in the US Congress. Now to me, that is the height of collusion. The height of collusion. Never mind the British government colluding with the Protestant paramilitaries. Here you had the Dublin government colluding with the British embassy in convincing and blackmailing the democratic top leadership, all the big Irish names, all great Catholics, to ban a congressional hearing. Now, if, if they tried to do that on any other country in the world, most countries in the world, there would be uproar, but yes. they got away with that. And notice that since that time, in all these hearings, we have had no representative from those parties or governments testifying. Why not? How come a great man, a great man by any criterion, like John Hume, vehemently opposed the McBride principles? I told him once at the meeting in Washington, John, everybody assumes this was tailor fitted for you. Everybody thinks this is what John Hume would be doing. Violently yes. opposed. Violently. And you know, that's, that's established and public. Um, what was the issue here? Why would the establishment resist all American involvement from a presidential level to a congressional level? Why were they opposed to congressional hearings? Now, some said, you see, Tip O'Neill and others would say, well, no, uh, you know, McManus wants to prof uh, provide a platform for terrorists from Ireland, conveniently forgetting that the people he was referring to, members of the IRA, were not allowed to come into the United States. Sinn Féin was banned from entering the United States. Jerry Adams only came in after the peace process was launched. Not only that, not only could they not get into the country to begin with, you cannot show up from Belfast unannounced at a congressional hearing saying, hey, you know, I'm Don Lavery from Belfast and I want to give my views here. They'll say, who the heck are you now? Were you invited? Well, bye-bye, take them out of here. Nobody can testify before Congress without an invitation. So it was totally bo bogus to say that we're stopping this to avoid providing a platform for terrorists. They were doing this to stop America being advised and told about British violation of human rights. Now, at the beginning, Donald asked the question of both of us, you know, what was the most horrible act of collusion? From an American point of view, and from someone who's been in the trenches in Congress forever, the worst example of collusion to me is that the American government, the American Congress deliberately in a calculated formal official fashion banned congressional hearings on human rights in Northern Ireland. To me, that is the most serious collusion of all because for this reason, nobody ever back then or now is surprised that the British colluded with the UVF. Sure, they did that at the beginning of the UVF. Nobody yes. was surprised that they colluded with the UDA. That was the function of the UDA. And, and it was a legal organization too. Yeah, up until what, 70, uh, up, until, up until the 90s? For 20 years. 
They were issuing press releases with impunity about killing Catholics for about 19 years in Belfast. And if that's not collusion, but that's that's expected. What I, in my naivety, didn't expect that there would come a time when the US Congress would formally and officially, with full knowledge, collude by hiding the truth from the British government atrocities in Northern Ireland. It's an appalling vista. You'll remember those words. Uh, you know, uh, an appalling vista. Um, and you can see I can get a little bit exercised by this. But you see, from an American point of view, it's appalling. And, and it should never have happened. And now if you ask any American, can you justify that? So it's a mother of God. There, there's no justification. There's no, absolutely no justification. No matter what position you come down on, uh, you, can, you cannot justify that. See on that point, um, now, Numerous people, whether it's people connected to unionism or nationalism here, people on the British side, the Irish side, they have all said that without the pressure that was put on President Clinton, there would never have been a peace process. And it was people like yourself that were exerting that pressure yeah. and holding his, yeah. holding his feet to the fire. And he did deliver in no. good faith. It, it was his he greatest did. foreign policy achievement. It's something America should be very proud of. Absolutely. And I, I would add this now. Uh, my whole role was building up pressure. I, uh, when you mentioned President Clinton, uh, the, the, I was not involved in the negotiations in the secret stuff that was headed up by Niall O'Dowd. God bless him. <clears throat> so I, I don't want any confusion. You know, it was the pressure that got Bill Clinton involved. But once the involvement started, number one, immediately I knew, listen, I have too much baggage to be involved in that. And I'll only get in the way. There are enough experts. There are enough experts in the British government and in the Dublin government and in the American government that know exactly what to do. And one of the sadness of my life here is when we talk about the Good Friday Agreement, which was wonderful and pivotal, thank God for that. Sadly, it came 30 years too late. Yeah. And the thing that haunts me is this. What if in 76, if that was the year, Carter was elected? He had been welcomed into Ireland to help out if he hadn't been rebuffed by Gareth Fitzgerald. As and a devout so Protestant too. Yes, and that, that was probably one of the reasons why Tip and Teddy, very Irish, very Catholic, said, how, how come we, how have we been outfoxed and, 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 and uh, outmatched by a Protestant from Georgia, for God's sake. He's not Irish, not Catholic. We are the leaders of Irish America. So, and of course, we saw the Teddy later on ran against <laughs> Jimmy yes. Carter. Yes, even though I have, a, I have a great admiration and respect for President Carter. Oh, yeah. Right. I, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. You know, like like everything else, he, he, he tried to back off from some of the commitments, but he, he stood he stood firm for human rights. So I, I, my hat's off to him. Um, so and one of the things that, that, that always struck me um, about the INC, and in particular the issue of the, the human rights hearings in Congress, was that actually, you I remember you mentioned before, and this really struck a chord with me, it was Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton that permitted those hearings to, to go on in the 90s when they had been banned for so many years. Well, yes. Uh, right, uh, right. Well, Republic. yes. Well, yes. The, the reality was that Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House. 
Uh, now, uh, Bill wouldn't have any, uh, the President of the United States has no say about wh what hearings take place. But of course, uh, they, they can have influence. But the great irony, that's one of the great ironies of my life. Hearings were banned by Irish Catholic speakers of the House. Mainly Democrats. Democrats for a long, long time. And when Newt Gingrich, a Protestant from Georgia, <laughs> now a Catholic, <laughs> he converted to Catholicism, and his, his wife was ambassador to the Vatican. But the real secret here was uh, Ben Gilman. Ben Gilman became the chairman of the overall top chairman of all foreign affairs. And the first thing he told me is that, Sean, you're going to have your hearings on McBride and on the RUC. Those were his committed commitment to me for years. And, and he did it. So uh, it, it was it was. But the reality is, if Speaker Gingrich had said, and now people understand the power of the Speaker of the House. If, if Newt Gingrich had said, then I forbid that hearing, then uh, that was it. That was the end of it. So he deserves credit in that. So what is wrong with that picture? That a it took a right, a right wing Georgia allows hearing Speaker Tip O'Neill, Mr. Irishman himself, Mr. Catholic. There's a monument in Donegal to him. God bless us. Yeah. Uh, a memorial of something. <laughs> he, he, he colluded at the yes. top level. Listen, the way you read a congressman or an American political leader, it's not really what to say. How did they use their power? How did they use their power? Tip O'Neill had real power. And what kills me is that at the time of the hunger strike, Bobby Sands died December 5th, 1981, that the president of the United States was, could have prevented it. Was Irish American, Reagan. Tip O'Neill, the second most powerful man in the land, and therefore one of the most powerful men in the world, both Irishmen, and they never did anything proportionate to their power. And you know, well, I don't want see. to hear, I don't want see to hear that Tip made some see private calls. You know, never mind the diplomatic thing, they had real power. They had yes. real power and they refused to exercise it. And here's another thought, which I have to throw in. Yes. Over and above the special relationship, and we all know about that, how America was so keen to not offend the British and all of that nonsense. But over and above that, if any country in the world was facing and forcing, in effect, 10 young men to die because they were protesting prison conditions anywhere in the world. And if that leader was black, America would have acted. Mm. But, and this grieves me to have to say this, but I think we're getting a better understanding of things now because of what happened at the storming of the capital and, and the white racism that was expressed in all of that and is still mounting Alive. in America very much. Yes, this right wing extremism. Where every, yeah, which every FBI former expert in all of this says it hasn't even been gone yet. The worst is coming. Now, we're beginning. Oh. Father Sean, see just how when you race have, plays you, into the. Just let me finish yes. on that. Yeah, if, yeah. If Maggie Thatcher had to be a black woman, Tip O'Neill and Reagan would probably have demanded she stop torturing people on hunger strike. 
but because yeah. she was English and white. And Protestant. Off. If, if, if that had to be anyone in South America, people of color, any, any leader of one of the countries in, in South America had done that, Tip O'Neill would be daily in front of cameras denouncing it. But when it came to Ireland, no, 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 I want to do things diplomatically, which is tips speak for doing nothing, doing nothing. On that point, um, one of the things I want to say that I find it very, very moving was that one of the people on hunger strike, Joe McDonnell, his daughter was actually staying with an American family as part of the, the program that was being run, the Irish Children's Fund uh, program that brought Protestant and Catholic children over um, to, for a period of respite to stay uh, and live amongst each other in an integrated society like America. And the, the family actually had to bring her back, send her back home while her father was dying on hunger strike. But what, how it shows how malicious things were that that young girl who's now a lady herself um she um gave an interview um to one of the american i, for, I forget which one it was but it was a mainstream media outlet which were they were just asking about the program out of interest because they find it a very constructive thing and immediately you know when she said I would really, she said words to the effect that I would really hope maybe that President Reagan could ring Mrs. Thatcher and save my father's life. Um, the British press seized on that immediately and said that this was some sort of IRA scheme to indoctrinate children and so forth and that it was a propaganda weapon. It was horrific. And that this emerged in a BBC documentary on the importance of the fact that American intervention in terms of that program by Dennis Mulcahy that that ultimately produced a generation of people who went on to cement the peace process. Oh yeah, and Mulcahy's yeah. a great man. Yes. Actually on that, I had asked Hamilton Fish, who was a really close friend of um, Vice President George Herbert Bush, Rich. to personally intervene. And he called me back a few days before Yeah, a few days before Bobby died and yeah. said, I've spoken to the vice president and he said, the sad news, America is not going to be involved. And then I knew it was all over. But in saying that, right, even though official America was not involved, oh, Jim no. Pryor, J Jim Pryor in his memoir, as, uh, who uh, there was a change, if, uh, Margaret Thatcher reshuffled her cabinet and put him to political Siberia, which was the north of Ireland. Uh -huh. um, he ended the hunger strike and he said that, um, I mean, essentially what he was doing was reinstating a status which the prisoners already had in a government that he had served under in the 70s under William Whitelaw. Um, but he also said that it was American agitation and support, particularly from people like Bernie Sanders, and we've seen the letters and so oh, yeah. forth, the correspondence yeah. Yeah. that was sent to Margaret Thatcher. That yeah. is what was pivotal in making the British force their hand and end the strike by conceding those demands, oh, yeah. even oh, yeah. though official. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. All across, we had great support, except to the very top. Yes. O'Neill and Reagan and. You, you had a, a great amount of unofficial support, which ultimately brought an end to the hunger strike and oh, resolved yeah. it. No. It's yeah. that, that, that was, I, I think that was one of, again, that was a real American foreign policy success in the sense that although there was the horror of 10 men dying, there could have been another 10, but for the fact that the oh, US yeah. did intervene no. No. in terms of the grassroots level. No. So, so on the issue of, right, I, I mean, the third question you've kind of answered in terms of the worst instance of British state collusion that you're a Barbara have ever in, uh, came across in terms of your um, lives. But is there anything that you would add to that, maybe a particular instance or anything, either of you that, I mean, Barbara mentioned internment and bloody some do, but I mean, has any, what about the McCord case? Yeah, Barbara is very touched by the McCord case. Go ahead, Barbara. All right. Raymond McCord's son was savagely beaten, so much so that they had to have a closed casket. Now, from a father, a parent's point of view, there's nothing more devastating 
and we are very happy to be able to help him present his case, which we have done and which we will continue to push for. I mean, there is his son died in 1997 and he still yep. has no closure on this issue. That's horrible. And there are other cases who, which will not be moved forward until he has closure on this case. So that's the worst type of complete uh, collusion that you want to bring it forward. And we stand yes. behind Raymond McCord as a parent, myself, as a parent, I can only yes. continue to feel the anguish he feels on a daily basis. This is not something that goes away. This is something that he lives with every day. He is not going to forget about it. Yes. Behind him, we want to help him. We brought him out just before COVID to see several Congress people to bring this case forward again. And Father Sean is committed to doing this, as am I. And this has to be one of the dearest to our hearts at the moment because of the anguish and the unfairness and the injustice at, that the British have continually perpetrated on the on the Irish. And you can go all the way back to Cromwell. And, <laughs> you can because yeah. he wanted to eradicate the Irish race. And you can, yes. and the famine, did people really think the Irish were gonna starve because one crop was bad? No, the Irish weren't even allowed to fish in their land. The food that was grown was sent out of Ireland. The Irish were told that they weren't good enough to raise their own children. They couldn't speak their own language. And language is the cornerstone of any culture. So Indeed. a long line. And you, you can go up to um, the internment, to Bloody Sunday, to the hunger strikers, to, to McCord, and to Richard Kerr, which we're yeah. working on now. And I find it particularly heinous when I look at my wonderful, precious children and grandchildren, and I have one grandson that's seven years old, a year younger than Richard was. And I look at little Brendan and I said to myself, oh my God, if he were treated like, I, I mean, this is something so horrendous. We are so behind raising this issue in Congress, which we are doing. And the credit goes to Father Sean because he's indefatigable. He will not be stopped, but any human being, and you don't necessarily have to be a parent, but if being a parent and makes it stronger, that this is something that that poor man suffered and many other children, and it's still going on in different places at different times. This is horrible. Something has to be done. And all these people who are against amnesty, they need closure. They need to hear that what was done to their relatives or to themselves was wrong. It is a disgrace that the British want to close the books on it. That should not be done. These people are suffering every day. You talk about PTSD, they have it. They are suffering every day, and we have to stand behind them. This one of the one of one of the things that I really re and I, I really really do admire the American legal system for this. It's head and shoulders above the British legal system. Is that you look at Watergate, right? You look at how cabinet ministers and senior advisors and attorney general were jailed on corruption charges. Can you ever imagine that happening in Britain? I mean, it it shows the difference in terms of the fact that. The Americans have an enlightened constitution. The British don't. There is no British constitution. Parliament, the British prime minister has so much power, but lacks accountability. Whereas the president is uh, constrained by a constitution and Congress and Americans have a bill of rights. I mean, I think that essentially one of the solutions to the Irish problem is going to be adopting the things which your country already has. Um, that's my view, but see, on the point that Barbara raised, um, I mean, I, I, I sort of switched question five um, first uh, in that um, in terms of, uh, because you mentioned the Richard Kerr case, I'd say that the case of the rape and the torture of children has been brought to your attention by way of the Richard Kerr and Concora Boys Home scandal. Tell us a bit about that campaign 
and what you would uh, hope to do in raising awareness for those victims and survivors of state sexual abuse who have been let down by the historical institutional abuse inquiry? Well, yes, uh, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And first of all, we have to acknowledge your role here, um, Donald, because this case, because of your influence and outreach, was brought to our attention. We had not been involved and would not have been involved had you not brought it up and had you not connected us also with Richard Kerr. So thank you. We're, we're very grateful for that. Um, and saying now, that as well, Father Sean, um, just before you elaborate, um, many people had contacted Richard over the years to get essentially details, the story and so forth about what happened with Concora. Uh, Richard is an Irish Protestant living in the US, surrounded by Irish Catholics. And it was yourselves, as, as an ecumenical group, but led by uh, is it yourself, is, you, yourself and Barbara as Irish Catholics, um, that were the only group that actually intervened to properly help them no. in, ter in terms of raising c crucial awareness of this issue in the greatest power sphere known to man. Well, you see, um... There's a number of reasons for that. We feel very deeply about this. From a maybe a theological point of view, I, I believe deeply that uh, ecumenism is at their very best, as is reconciliation, when Protestants and Catholics actually work for justice. Now, Unfortunately, the term reconciliation has been hijacked by the politicians, because if you say, well, I hope the people of Northern Ireland can be reconciled, that absolves the British government and the Dublin government and all the politicians from any role or any part. In other words, the problem is with them. No, no. The problem is with structures. Mm. Pope John Paul referred to those structures as struct structures of sin. So ecumenism to be genuine and authentic has to mean that the different groups work together for justice. And I'm doubly conscious of another aspect of all of this is because Look, if someone from Fermanagh or Belfast is mistreated by the British and the Catholic, no big surprise there. They're so used. Yes. To it. In fact, they can almost, many of them wear it as a badge of honor if they speak out, if they become whistleblowers, and they'll know what's going to happen to them. But they'll get solidarity from their own people, even people who may totally disagree with them, but they'll have Catholic nationalist republican solidarity mm. whereas in the protestant community if you become a whistleblower against the monarchy against the government and above all the sacred cow of british intelligence you're isolated marginalized dismissed demeaned you become a non-person i was very conscious of that and that's why we were very anxious of helping both the um, the, the, the people uh, here, Raymond McCord, great man, yes. and Richard Kerr. So uh, now, as you know, it's an old case, so to speak, but the suffering is as fresh as yesterday for both men for different reasons. But, um, you know, we're dealing in, in the case of, care it's definitely a very cold case so very. it's not as if you get immediate reaction as if so for example with boris johnson saying the stuff about amnesty and the denial of inquests and all of that congress had to respond immediately because this was the british government saying something outrageous and something brand new so this thing is going to take time to work it its way but let me let me explain a little bit uh, and I will not divulge the conversations um, because I'll leave, leave it to members of Congress, excuse me, to speak for themselves. But let me tell you from the point of view of raising the issue, 
despite all that is going on in Congress, all of, I mean, there's hearings about everything and the emergency meetings and the examination of what really happened uh, on January in the invasion of the Capitol, the role of Trump and all of that stuff. The Congress is in, inundated with huge, huge issues. However, despite all of that, we were able to brief at length um, some of the very key committees. In fact, every key committee we wanted to speak to. The aforementioned Richard Neal, uh, who's the chairman of the Friends of Ireland, but significantly from an American congressional point of view, he's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. A very, very powerful, one of the most powerful committees in, in the Congress, not so much in the Irish issue, except, except in this sense. If Boris Johnson wants to have a trade deal with America, hmm. Richard and his committee and the Speaker of the House have said time and time again, no deal if what you're doing hurts the Good Friday Agreement. That was, that was essential. Uh, and, th and that is so very important. So the other key committee, uh, not so much on the Irish issue, but it's good to have powerful committees involved, even though they're not dealing with the Irish issue per se, which are dealt with the foreign affairs. The other one is Carolyn, Carolyn Maloney, Maloney, who's the chair of the Congressional Oversight Committee. And that is rated as the most powerful committee of all because yes. investigates members of Congress. Congress and the state. Very, very powerful. Okay. So we, we had lengthy discussions. Congressman Richard, uh, Congressman Keating of Massachusetts, not too well known, but you may know, and let me explain it to the public here, that just a couple of months ago, he surprisingly uh, held a congressional hearing as chair of the European Energy and Cyber Committee on, on the situation in Northern Ireland at the moment. And uh, that, that was a very welcome involvement. We've spoken to their, his key person. The other big, uh, very important committee is the Tom Lantis Human Rights Committee, uh, a commission actually headed up by Jim McGovern, a great Cavan name. And I've known Jim since he was a student in, in the local, one of the local university, fiercely committed to human rights, one of the really good guys. And he is the co-chairman, but also currently now, the other co-chairman is the great um, friend of um, Barbara's because he's from New Jersey. And you know, New Jersey people are very clannish lot to stick together. Congressman Chris Smith, for years, uh, uh, he has held more congressional hearings uh, in the subcommittees that he chaired than anyone else in the history of the United States Congress. So he's, and I, I've talked, to, we've talked to his people. So put that all together and uh, we have it truly well raised. Now, one can never predict what's going to happen in Congress because a thousand things can affect it. But the important thing is nothing happens until the community or the people raise the issue in Congress. And, and we have certainly done that. Um, we've certainly done this uh, on, on this case. Congress is now in recess practically and they'll be gone for several weeks. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to, uh, my concern, even though everything was happening, and that it, in one sense, it was the worst possible time to try to bring a new issue into focus. We didn't want to leave it longer because, and thank God we didn't, because, you know, the one, the one hearing that is going to consume all of America is the investigation into what happened at the storming of the Capitol. 
well, a lot of us know already what has happened, you know. And here I might add, and one of the things uh, Anthony raised was how uh, how does the situation in Ireland um, affect Americans? Uh, how does it impact how they see things? Here's an interesting thing. And I, I've said this now to several people, in including the Northern Ireland Bureau folk, fine people. Um, the chairman, the leader, is a firm man, a man. So enough said. He's a fine guy Indeed. <laughs> and uh, a very fine man. Um, uh, the um, I, 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 it's ironic, and I love irony. <laughs> It's ironic that at this time, America's, Americans may better understand the problem in Northern Ireland than ever before, even though it's not top of the news at all at, at the moment. And it's because of what happened on January the 6th, the storming of the Capitol. Yes. Because the sea those with eyes to see, they see that was all about white supremacy. And aha, what are they looking at in Northern Ireland? By way of precedent. British Protestant supremacy. And when we talk about Protestantism, you know, I'm an admirer of Martin Luther. Uh, he of was course. a great man and he yes. did a lot of good. He was wrong. He was a terrible anti-Semite, but he, he, I, I think he was a good man. But you know, when we talk about the English Reformation, do yeah. not confuse yeah. that with Luther's Reformation. Luther's yes. Reformation was about theology. And, and the Enlightenment. Scripture. Yes. The the uh, English Reformation had nothing to do with religion. It was and to do with Parliament and the King. With, yeah, everything to do with Henry VIII. Uh, <laughs> so I think now, from here on in, I think many Americans are going to be viewing Northern Ireland through the prism of supremacy. Mm. Supremacy. And color really has nothing to do with that. It's, you know, who are the chosen people in America? Oh, white Protestant people. Who are the chosen people outlined, documented, and proudly boasted about in Northern Ireland? Northern Ireland Protestants. Nothing really to do with um, theology or anything, but it's to do with supremacy. Even and, though they're a minority now. Yes. And, and, and they're a minority on the island. I mean, you yes, need to bear that. And always were on the island. But Indeed, now, yes. within Northern Ireland, a minority. And that was what motivated the charging of the capital, the mm. fear of losing supremacy. And I think that Protestants are best understood and unionists and loyalists, and I know an awful lot of them. And I'm most ecumenical, and I've told those guys, even the UD and all those fellows in the early days, at the end of the day, your best friend in Washington is going to be someone like me. Yes, it is, yeah. Uh, because of what I believe in. Um, well, also, say on that point, um, can I say that it, whenever we raised the Richard Kerr case with you, one of the things that really impressed me was that I mean, everyone in the room, I mean, I mean, primarily it was men, but Barbara stood out in that she was so warm and receptive and understanding about the plight that Richard had been through. And she had mentioned about just her own children and grandchildren there. And I find that that really made a difference in terms of the dynamic um, in that, I mean, as you know, anyone who's been through that would be absolutely traumatized by the way the state has treated them um, and used them as I mean, Lear McKee, I think, coined the phrase as boy soldiers in a war of intelligence against the loyalists um, to manipulate events. Um, the, bear in mind, the main, well, one of the central abusers at Concora 
William McGrath penned the birth certificate of the UDA. Um, he made the contacts that brought the guns in for Ulster resistance, which were used in the murder of a relative of mine and other people that you're cognizant of. Um, but by way of Richard, um, I think one of the interesting things about this and which will really draw Americans in is that one of the people who abused Richard, the, the celebrity doctor psychiatrist based in Belfast, Morris Fraser, um, was indicted by a grand jury in New York um, for the sexual abuse of various boys in America as part of a heightened, powerful pedophile ring, which had links to 10 Downing Street. Uh, to advisors to the Thatcher government, to uh, cabinet ministers, um, and also to her private secretary, all of whom were up to their necks in what was going on at Kinkora. But what I will say is that she, more than anyone, and this has been acknowledged by people like Ken Livingston and Colin Wallace, um, who are quite different in background, <laughs> um, that she, more than anyone, benefited from this because she used it as leverage against both the unionists and also the wets in the Conservative Party who were also involved in the sexual abuse of boys at Concora um, to ensure that her right wing extremism, jingoistic element, essentially reigned supreme in the Tory party when they weren't really that fond, the British establishment were really that fond of Thatcher in terms of the, the aristocracy. But she knew so much about them, people like Blunt and Mountbatten and so forth, that they couldn't depose her. You know, it took years to do that. Well, well, the horrible thing is, and, and the Belfast Telegraph, to its credit, carried the headline. Um, the, there can be no doubt that MI5 knew all about Kinkora. Absolutely. And this uh, is, I mean, th th this has come from people like Captain Colin Wallace and Captain Brian Gamble. I mean, these are not exact. I mean, they're hardly nationalist sympathizers. No. They were loyal to Queen and Country, right. two Protestant loyalists who were honorable members of the British Armed Forces who blew, tried to blow the whistle on the most horrendous sexual abuse of children and how children were being used as state assets in a war of intelligence and paramilitarism at the height of the conflict, including against people who you had come into contact with as a sort of dignitary and mediator, people like John McCaig and stuff. I mean, the revelations emerged after that, obviously, but I mean, now it makes sense as to how these people were being manipulated. And you know, the unionist Protestant community has to know that, that whenever it suits them, the British government will use and abuse and exploit them. They have Indeed. done it historically, they did it over Brexit, the, and they will keep doing it for as long as England is in control of a smidgen of Ireland. Of Ireland. Land. Smidgen. The, the, the thing that struck me is that, I mean, one of the reasons I got in contact with you about Richard's case was that you had always been an outspoken critic of clerical sexual abuse. But I think one of the things that distinguishes this case from, say, other cases where, uh, that happened in the various different Christian denominations um, is that the state is more powerful than a religious institution. It can pass laws, change laws, uh, enact secrecy and so forth in a way which a a church or religious organization can't quite do to the same extent. And in terms of Kinkora, I mean, Richard had been so let down by the historical institutional abuse inquiry, despite prima facie evidence of this horrendous pedophile ring, that inquiry, the judge in question, the British judge Hart, uh, made it clear to begin with that he did not feel that he had the oversight to properly look into the security services and intelligence agencies. And a high, I mean, as a high court judge, he accepted a verbal promise from a British minister that these organizations would cooperate in full. And we know they certainly didn't. I mean, yeah. people like Colin Wallace and Brian Gamble had said they were, you know, they disengaged because this, this was a glorified talking shop. It didn't have the proper um, teeth to actually get to the problem. And the interesting thing about Richard's case is that 
it blows a hole in the total British narrative on Kinkora because they had said that the abuse was confined to the staff at the home who were convicted and pleaded guilty. They were represented by Paisley's right-hand man, Desmond Bull. Um, in terms of the case, uh, they did a plea bargain with the Crown the night before to plead guilty to avoid a protracted trial um, uh, in the 80s. But the, the, the ultimate aspect of it is Richard was trafficked from place to place to be abused by powerful people, including people with connections in the US who were also abusing US citizens like this Dr. Morris Fraser, who was convicted in New York and on numerous occasions, indicted by a grand jury. And now the PSNI are refusing freedom of information requests to academics like Dr. Niall Meehan, to myself and so forth, regarding this pedophile doctor. Um, that is, I mean, on the grounds of national security, which raises the question, and I put it to both you and Barbara, how can a paedophile psychiatrist who has been convicted in America and in the UK jurisdiction for the sexual abuse of children, including those in his care as a, as a doctor, how can he be considered a national security asset? That is a very disturbing development. Because he was obviously deeply involved with the British intelligence network. Yes. And yeah. the, sadly now, the, the, we, I think it's well known that the, the, the pedophiles have an international ring. They do. And, you know, uh, and, that, and they all know each other. And it's all done in secret. And if you know the right people, you can get away with it. That's one of the uh, messages that Richard uh, delivers <laughs> very effectively. Your point about the state, the difference between a church and a state. Look, it was the state that should have been locking up priests and other people who were abusing <laughs> kids. I mean, bishops can't do that. No, you know. Not not for centuries anyway, but that's the role of the police. That's yes. the role of the state. Um, that's their job. Arrest them, convict them, put them away. That's the role of the state. Um, yes. And it's uh, and I am very conscious as we speak here about the terrible tradition or the terrible policy for many years of how church figures hid clerical sex abuse. It has damaged the church probably for all time. There was a time that families and parents felt very good that the little kids were hanging out but a church and they, they were protective and they were with safe people, parishioners and priests. That has been shot to hell. Now, yeah. you know, there was a time in the American movies universally, you know, from the 50s, 40s, 50s, and the sixth time of being crossed and all of that. Anytime a Catholic priest came on, you could say, Oh, he's the good guy. Yes, now, people like Fight and Chain. If I see a movie starting, I think, oh, God, this is going to be one of those sick priests who abuse kids, you know. So it has, it's had profound, it left profound destruction in its path. Um, and that, that's why we, we really want to help. Um, Richard, I think, is, is dealing with this horror very well considering uh he doesn't try to deny that that he's still haunted by it you know but but he's um he's uh, he's deeply traumatized still yes. by it all and you know the fact that it didn't just happen once but it happened with people associated with the home who were supposed to be looking out for him, protecting him and you know uh, and it was former done, cops. done by powerful people. Yes. Done by powerful people in powerful in that context, you know, an awful betrayal. Um, 
And the fact that, I mean, even people like Colin Wallace, who had been commended so many times for honours within the British system, the fact that he felt the need to turn to the media, particularly the media in the south of Ireland, and raise the issue with them, and that, well, put it this way, right, this is the ultimate proof that the state were aware of this. When the Irish Independent ran the article that at the time Jerry Fitt was going to use parliamentary privilege to raise the issue of a, of a child sex racket that was being ran at a Belfast home, they did not name the home and they did not name the staff, but immediately the Belfast Corporation moved to shut down Kinkora. Now, what does that tell you? The history of complaints that were going on and the, the fact that people were up to their necks in it, uh, who were unionists within Belfast City Council. Um, and I mean, I'd say people like James Molyneux and so forth. Revelations have emerged about them now that they're dead. I mean, you know, it's it's talked about more easily and victims credibly come forward with these allegations against other Enoch Pyle was another one. Um, it's horrific to think that for years the state knew these MPs and representatives were involved in this and rather than prosecute them they were using it as political leverage over them and to prolong the conflict. I mean the, 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 one of the things that Chris Moore has highlighted in his book on Kinkora was that actually um, Brian Nelson and William McGrath knew each other and the, the connection with South Africa had been built by McGrath based on right-wing evangelical connections uh, with the South African regime, who again, they felt that they were one of the lost tribes of Israel and a chosen oh. people. Oh. Yes, this, the issue of supremacy, as you mentioned, is an international problem. I mean, it goes to the core of sort of inequalities that exist in the world. But I mean, in, in terms of I'm just moving on to my final question is that how do you feel about the issue? I mean, you and Barbara have seen many cases, but how do you both feel about the issue of policing in the north currently as it stands? Well, you know, um, I wanted and still want to believe that there has been a, a big, big change with the police. Yes. However, uh, and I believe in many levels that has happened. But what is one to think when one is told by Raymond McCord's attorney, Paul Farrell, that for 21 years, the police have refused to give the court the essential documents. And the judge has said, I can't move until I get those for 21 years yeah. because they lack the manpower. I mean, how can one possibly think that is something that is normal? Democratic yeah. and, uh, and also I mean, trans transparent. You know, and, and you know, the behavior, the physical behavior of the police thank God, you know, they're no longer beating people up by wholesale or torturing them or, or shooting them or anything like that. But the fact that they're withdrawing and holding essential testimony, essential documents, is also a, a profound form of collusion. Yes. Uh, I mean, I cannot imagine how a high court judge or whatever the judge who kept saying, well, I, you know, I haven't got the documents. Why can't he order the police and say, look, we give you one month, two months, whatever. You have to, by court order, deliver those documents, period, or you'll be in contempt of court. That doesn't seem to happen over there. And, and yes. why is that? I, I, you know, I don't understand that. Um, I how will, uh, can the police I, get away with that? 
I, I raised um, with you, I mean, you and Barbara are aware that in terms of my grandfather's brother's murder, um, Martin Lavery, um, which was mentioned in the documentary No Stone Unturned, um, the fact that the police knew 48 hours in advance he was going to be murdered and the same guns that it was Ulster Resistance had brought in were used by the UCF to commit that murder and then Lachlan Island after it. Um, the thing, the problem that exists here, and this I quote the former police ombudsman, Dr. McGuire. He described his role, and he's been given, I think, an MBE. He described his role in regulating the police as trench warfare and said that the police ombudsman's office is engaged in legal battles with the police over this issue of disclosure of information. And also the problem is the police ombudsman can only go after serving or former police officers. They can't look into the UDR and so forth. It's, it's beyond their legal scope, so to speak. That was one of the sort of technicalities that the British state play on quite a lot. But um, I mean, I think it's pressure from people like yourselves that, that is going to be absolutely necessary in terms of America to really tackle this issue of policing. And what I would favor, and I hope, I imagine you agree, would be to move to, well, an American style model whereby you can elect a district attorney or indeed what the Welsh people and the English people do, they elect a police commissioner to actually deal with it so that, yes, there'd be mistakes, but at least you can sack them at the ballot box. And I think that's very important, being able to hire and fire the people who make those decisions instead of having chief constables, police ombudsmen and so forth appointed by establishment lackeys. I think that's a very, very vital thing. I mean, people struggled so hard for the vote. Why not democratize the police? That, that's the point, yes, the point that I would make. Now, yeah. in, in, in terms of Anthony's questions that he had raised, because I mean, as, as you know, he is unwell, but still with us. Um, I'm just going to move on to those um, and uh, ask you to expand on them just with the time that we have left. Um, but, uh, he has asked, Anthony has asked me um, to put you, how does Father Sean McManus and Barbara see the progressive wing emerging within the Democratic Party? Um, and their strong positions of upholding minority and oppressed people's rights domestically and elsewhere or abroad, and what influence or position does he see or is aware of them taken in relation to the North of Ireland issues, whether it's people like uh, the outstanding Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Cory Bush, Bernie Sanders, Ed Markey, and Nina Turner. I mean, what is your take on that, and do you think that they will be friends of Ireland? Well, let me comment on just one name you read out. The former Congressman Ed Markey, now Senator of the great state of Massachusetts, has without doubt in 40 years, the worst, most useless record on Ireland of any member of the Congress. He was at a stage proud to boast that his congressional district, which changed later, was the most Irish constituency in the whole of the United States, we could never get him to say boo to the British. Hmm. Never, ever. He simply refused to be involved, which, you know, now all the others, fine. Bernie Sanders was one of the first to support the McBride principles. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, we welcome this awareness of what is happening in this country. Now, people want to dismiss it as saying they're woke. Well, as someone recently said, hey, what about those of us who have never gone to sleep? We no need to be woke. Uh, but I think it's going to this is another sample, I think, of how Americans are beginning to understand stuff. And amazingly, <laughs> it was the election of a very moderate, middle of the road, very traditional former Senator Joe Biden, who has brought all this to a head. 
Now, Second Irish Catholic. With, with all due respect to, to Biden, uh, whom I recognize as a good and great man, mm -hmm. Trump could make anyone look good who followed him, really, <laughs> because <laughs> this was the most disastrous, unbelievable development. You know, three minutes by car, seven minutes up the road from where we are thousands of white people storm the u.s capitol Ku Klux, Ku Klux to, Klan types. to kill and maim and take back the country and here's the amazing thing you know when people do wrong and attack they run away and try and hide these people didn't run they hung yes. around and i was thinking what in god's name do the things that's going to happen after they have done their, this stuff they obviously yeah. thought nothing was going to happen that everybody would applaud them and that trump would come back in and lead the glorious revolution and we we know all about glorious revolutions in, <laughs> in ireland but there is now the beginning of the realization and the timing may be surprising but maybe Trump brought it all to a head, is that people are saying, oh my God, this is what it's about. Hmm. It's about people who have never accepted equality. Yes. Who refuses to accept equality. Does that ring a bell about Northern <laughs> Ireland? Absolutely. <laughs> so. Yes. I don't want to harp on this, but, but you know, obviously, oh, stuff very in okay. size and scale and intensity. I mean, that's that's indisputable. But here, the common thread throughout all the world is a refusal to accept others as equals yes. that's what the british empire was built on mm -hmm. that's what the transported <laughs> uh, evocative word imported to america that's what america is still trying to recover from so yes. i see you know the stages here are George Washington came along and kicked England out. Yes. God bless him. Then Martin Luther King came along. The uh, uh, well, Lincoln came along, freed the slaves. Great man. And then, but he had to do it. Slavery was still there. Can you imagine that? Then Martin Luther King had to take up the uh, the mantle and continue the battle. But that fight has not been settled or resolved in this country nor in the six counties of northern ireland or in many places in the world so color religion all of that in one deep sense is immaterial they're simply used as weapons again the equality. issue is this people refusing people in power refusing to accept others as equals that's yes, the it. rights of other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, essentially, the power structure is refusing to accept the rights of other people. And you yeah. mentioned about the issue of Trump and the upheaval in the capital. It reminded me an awful lot of the precedent of what Paisley did during the Ulster Workers' Strike in the 70s. Very similar. Yes, yes. And you know, as I all I could think of is that before we knew what was happening, many people said, you know, that um, had the invaders and the insurrection been led by black people uh, or Muslims, the guns would have come out very quickly. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it would, would be like the difference between loyalists invading Stormont in those days that get away to, with it, most of it. Whereas if the IRA tried to do it, yeah. That'd be mowed down by the hundreds, you know. So well, look, look at when Michael Stone tried. I mean, he was apprehended, arrested, and so forth, and tried to say it was a work of art. 
if that had been an IRA man, they'd probably have been shot on sight. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It it's it's the you know that crazy senator from Wisconsin, Johnson, mm. said, "Well, if those people in who invaded the Capitol had been black, yeah, I might have been worried, but I wasn't worried because they were all white." Now, if that doesn't absolutely candidly state the issue, nothing will. Um, so supremacy. I, I keep saying the two great evils in the world, sectarianism, mm. racism and sectarianism. And it's all bound up with we are the people. We mm. are God's elected people. We are the supreme people. And whenever there's a threat of our supremacy being questioned, not only will we do very bad things, but we have a perfect right. We have had advanced absolution before we do anything because we are God's elect. Uh, and that's deeply embedded in this country, transported by England. It's Indeed. deeply embedded in Northern Ireland, sadly, yeah. still to say, sadly. Mm -hmm. and And you know, there's no point in, uh, you know, I was criticized, if you can imagine this, <laughs> by some sort of Irish activist saying, well, McManus shouldn't be harping on about anti-Catholic discrimination. And that was said with a serious face. And, you know, and I said to that person, go and tell blacks in America that they should stop talking about discrimination. Go and tell Jewish Americans they should stop talking about anti-Semitism. Nobody accepts that unless someone has in, in, imbibed what they were told by the oppressor that yes. act, they've internalized that, yeah, well, we can't expect full rights because we're not really equal. So we shouldn't be expecting too much. Now that person needs to be woke, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would hope just in terms of concluding that one question by Anthony, in that essentially the INC would be built. I mean, I imagine this is already happening, but you're building the inroads and bridges to this progressive wing that's developing within the Democratic Party in terms of the issue of human rights and also the cause of Ireland. Um, uh, uh, although I understand, I mean, many of them are fresh faces to Congress and it's, you know, they're really just sort of getting in there. But there are people out there. I mean, one of the people that struck me that was very impressive was the lady who ran against uh, Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, Cynthia Nixon. She has an excellent record on the issue of human rights. Oh. Um, and I think that therein we have allies because who fears equality? Oh. I mean, that's oh. the ultimate sort of that is the, the oh. issue in terms of both Ireland and America who is afraid of equality yeah. and that that is the ultimate That's, distinction in terms and of people the sad thing is many many people are scared of equality and you know when we're talking about the Good Friday Agreement and I think the question was mentioned earlier on at some stage that yes. um, could the example of the Good Friday Agreement be used as a model over the world? Well, yes, Anthony, yes but I'm, uh, Anthony I'm, I'm that, a bit hesitant. Yeah. I'm a bit hesitant to apply it automatically. The other thing that amazes me about this is that some people from the North, the unionist community mainly, not exclusively, but people who never accepted the Good Friday Agreement are traveling the world, giving advice about how to end conflict and how yeah. to implement Good Friday Agreement principles. And yet, as Brian Feeney, the sage from the Irish News, continually points out, the DUP has still not embraced the Good Friday Agreement. Yes, so, which is why they deposed Mrs. Foster. Eh? It's why they deposed Mrs. Foster, because she oh. was an Anglican who was trying to be pragmatic in a deeply uh. evangelical party, um, which ultimately opposed the agreement, Paisley led the campaign, and then 
he said, he made it very clear in an interview with Stephen Nolan that the Blair government, along with Bertie Ahern, had become so exacerbated by the unionists that Tony Blair and his government, alongside the Irish foreign minister, had said to him, if you don't work this, which the people have voted for in 1998, then we are going to impose Plan B. And that was joint authority. And one of the things that the New Ireland Forum had produced, but had never enacted, and he Paisley had stated that it was, an, it was a total anathema, the idea that ministers from Dublin would be coming up and administering essentially a form of Irish rule uh, over the six counties alongside direct rule ministers from London, who, let's be honest, the English MPs coming over here, they don't care about the unionists and loyalists. You know, Never. They're, Never. They're, they're here because uh, as colonial administrators uh, and simply to, as they say it, um, well, uh, manage the decline uh, until an eventual handover. Gentlemen, I'm getting a signal from the boss, the lovely yes. Italian lady here, that <laughs> we, we have another uh, meeting Indeed. coming up. So, I think, Tony, yeah, I'm I delighted think. to have met you. And no doubt, um, Donald, I'll be hearing from you. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so I, I've enjoyed this and I'm very grateful to you both. Barbara, do you want to sign off? Goodbye, gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And thank you, Father Sean, because without you, it would not happen. I have to, uh, in terms of concluding it, I have to say an enormous thank you to both of you for your time, your effort, and your dedication. And again, I really do thank you for the work that you're doing in terms of Richard Kerr and seeking to raise awareness. This horrendous injustice. We'll do what we can, Anthony and I, um, in terms of trying to raise as much awareness as possible in both the young and old generation and bring this issue and other issues that we spoke about up as much as possible. And indeed, we may have a follow up whenever it sits. God bless America. God save Ireland. Indeed. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much, Father Sean.